This morning's scripture lesson comes from uh, Acts 5, uh, 27 through uh, 32. And I'm, I decided to just back this up to 25 this morning if it gives a little better continuity of what's going on here. Uh, so we start at 25. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are the witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who who obey him. The words of God for the people of God and all God's people said, Praise, Praise be to God. God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you once again and we ask that the words of my mouth be your words and they fall upon open ears and minds and especially open hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I asked this question uh, not too long ago uh, during children's service. Uh, have you ever wanted to be an age older than you are now? Well, we got some very interesting answers, some great answers, and I praise the Lord for that. But I think we can also ask similar types of questions like this to adults. For instance, I have always wanted to be a musician, but I don't have any musical talent. Okay, uh, I, I've always wanted to write a book, but I never have enough time. Uh, some of you may have always wanted to be a, a sports figure, or an athlete, or something like that. Or maybe you've got a dream job out there that you'd just like to try sometime. I think the list goes on and on, and, and only you knows what this means. Uh, a lot of this might be just wishful thinking, and, and sometimes it might be uh, denote some dissatisfaction. But if it's something that can be done, then do it. Do it. Start now. Nothing happens without action. Uh, sometimes, sometimes we succumb to the grass is greener on the other side of the hill mentality. Uh, if you suffer from this, well, let me reassure you that I've been up and down many a hill in my life, and it's pretty much the same on both sides. Uh, uh, when I run across people like this, I give uh, advice something like this. If you are unhappy here, you'll be unhappy no matter where you go. And if you are happy here, you'll be happy just about anywhere. This morning, we are going to take a look at the scripture to see how to be happy, even when others are trying to make us miserable. Uh, George Rhodes tells the story uh, of a uh, general in the Persian army who captured a spy and sentenced him to death. Now, the general had a strange custom of giving the condemned criminal a choice between the firing squad and going through a big black door. Uh, as a time for execution came near, the spy was brought before the general who asked him the question, what's it going to be, the firing squad or the big black door? Well, the spy hesitated for quite some time. It was a difficult decision, but finally he chose the firing squad, and in a few moments, he, he died a few moments later. The general then turned to his right-hand man and said, they always prefer the known to the unknown. It's characteristics of people to be characteristic of people to be afraid of the undefined. Yet we gave him a choice. Then the aide asked, he said, Well, what lies beyond that big door? Freedom, replied the general. I've only known a few men brave enough to take it. It's pretty much the same way with following Jesus. You can either go to the firing squad or you can choose Jesus and have freedom, sometimes for the first time in your life. As we begin this morning, 
We need to review what's been transpiring in the lives of, of the disciples. You know, it wasn't too long ago they were fishermen and tax collectors. They were farmers and business people of kindred and, and Colfax, rural Colfax. They were minding their own business, you know, living life and suddenly, bang, their lives have changed for the good. One thing about coming to know Jesus is that you are completely different than you were five minutes before he enters your life. Uh, so they changed. And then they, they entered this, this three-year apprenticeship. And even though they were walking and talking with the very God of the universe, you know, they were still pretty green. Uh, actually, they were, as far as I'm concerned, they are pretty smart because it, it took me ten years of apprenticeship before I finally got it enough to preach it, but then I'm not the brightest bulb of the marquee anyway. So uh, I hope you're getting the picture here. They still don't get it after Jesus is put to death, but it's starting to come together a little bit. Then comes Pentecost, and all things change again, and they would never be the same. They all became absolute believers that wouldn't be shaken by anything, including their own death. They now know that Jesus has conquered death, and they realize for the first time, maybe for the first time really, that Jesus is God, and what that means. And we have to realize this also. In our modern world, we've, we've kind of lost the meaning of being a Christian. We talked a little bit about this last week, where, where people come to church to be entertained by the pastor or the music. Where in the world do you read this in the Bible? I don't see it anywhere. We want Jesus and the church to be comfortable. I'll tell you that you'll have a better life with Jesus, but it sure might not be more comfortable. Meeting and walking with Jesus is often uncomfortable, and sometimes it's very uncomfortable. Kenneth Sawyer paraphrases the calling of the first disciples, and, and we can fit ourselves into this also. He, he, he states, Jesus calls us, uh, you want adventure? Follow me. You want challenge? Follow me. You want excitement? Follow me. You want to fulfill your destiny? Follow me. You want to experience transformation in yourself and others? Follow me. You aren't here to be in a safe place. You are here to be comfortable. You are here to take chances and to be alive. I've had more adventures in the last 10 years than my whole life put together. And I envy lifetime pastors and missionaries and, and just plain lifelong Christians like many of you because of all the great memories of adventures that you've had. So instead of praying, Lord, make things easier and safer and more comfortable, we should pray, Lord, give me the biggest, toughest, riskiest task ever. I believe with your help, I can make a difference. So this is a starting point for the disciples and us. Many non-believers and, and, and some believers think that this whole story is just too far-fetched to have happened this way, and I don't think so for many reasons. And the main one is that it's reported in the Bible, and the Bible is always right. But the, another reason is even more intense. I just talked a little bit, reviewed the history of the disciples a little bit, and noticed something that was happening during this time. Notice what was happening. Love was in the air. Love was in the air, but not the kind of love that we often think about. Uh, I think that there's a cycle to love. We start out with this attraction, and then that grows when the disciples first left their former lives, they were strongly attracted to Jesus for some reason. Jesus attracts people. I can't explain it. But, but, but it's there. It's there. And there's just something about Jesus that gets this whole process started. The disciples came to Jesus and their love grew every day because of the things that Jesus did and how he did them. Before Jesus died, they all loved Jesus. Jesus as their God. But this is nothing. This was nothing compared to what was coming up. After the Holy Spirit came upon them, they became totally dedicated to Jesus and all that he stood for. All the disciples died a martyr's death, except John, who probably died of natural causes while he was imprisoned at Patmos for following Jesus. So that, you know, that could be a martyr's death too. Excuse me. Look how many times Paul was beaten, arrested, stoned, shipwrecked, all for the sake of Jesus. The torture, the beatings, the imprisonment happened to all the disciples. 
by this time, by the time, uh, this time their love for Jesus was complete. They would follow Jesus to death, to their death, but they would never, ever, ever denounce him. They knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that when they died, they would be with Jesus. Now that's a comforting thought, if there ever was one. And we are called to do the same thing. You know, luckily we don't have to put on a flowing robes and walk around the country anymore. We've got modern technology and much of it hasn't been tapped. There are millions of ways to reach people. There are as many ways to reach out to people as there are people. We can only do this if we are in love with Jesus above all other people and things. Jesus Christ needs to be number one in your life and not just someone you come to worship on Sunday and Sunday only or maybe worse yet just once in a while. We, the people of the church, have been lulled into a false sense of tranquility by none other than the devil himself. We think it's our job not to offend anyone. We can do anything in the name of Jesus and it's okay. Well, this is all false. Remember a few weeks back, I, I said that we shouldn't be following the national norm and embracing diversity. When we do, we only split ourselves farther from the people groups we're trying to that are being diverse, diverse is divisive. It's, it's all the same word. Instead, we should be embracing commonality. Commonality. We have to look for things in common in order to get along with anyone. And if you don't believe that, then just think about this. When two people get married, they don't focus on their differences. If they want to stick together, they focus on what they have in common. This, this is the way they show the other person how much love they have for them. There's no love in diversity. Jesus wants us to be like him, in common with him, and not different than him. He came to show us the way, and his way is always the right way, and there are no exceptions. So we are to love Jesus with all we have and try to act like him as much as possible. And in the process of this supreme love, we need to be prepared for the suffering love that accompanies it. When the disciples started out, they were hated by the Jews, the ruling Jews. After all, uh, the ruling Jews had just gotten rid of Jesus by hanging him on the cross. And now we have the disciples right back in the temple preaching the same way they got Jesus killed. Just before uh, this reading this morning, the disciples had been arrested for preaching the gospel, which, which is something that could happen in this country before long. And anyway, they were placed in a public jail for all to see. During the night, an angel of the Lord came and released them. And the next morning, guess where they were? They were right back in the temple preaching, and the people were happy. But the Sanhedrin was really upset. So they sent someone to the jail, and they found that all the doors were still locked, but the disciples were gone. So now we have the guards and the soldiers scared. Remember, we talked last week about it. Oh, these people were very superstitious, and here we go again. So, so they take the so the soldiers take the disciples peacefully to the rulers. They didn't use force. And now we come to today's reading. The persecution is just the beginning. It's just beginning for the disciples. Excuse me, I'm running out of water here. The Jewish rulers at this point are livid. They're livid. They want to put these guys to death, especially after Peter makes his famous statement, we must obey God rather than men. That's a radical statement even today, but it's also a basic truth. Then he goes on telling them that they were the ones that killed God, Jesus, by hanging him on the tree. Now you can just imagine how that went over. In the end, a Pharisee named Gamaliel saves them so that they are only flogged only flogged people. Think of how terrible that is. Thus begins a cycle of persecution that continues to this day. We have to begin to stand for what the Bible says. We have to obey the word of God and not the word of man when it, when it conflicts. And there are conflicts. It's up to us to stand for the unborn children who are being slaughtered every day. Life is sacred. It's up to us to say that homosexuality is wrong. We are told this many, many times in the Bible. It's up to us to stand for the Lord's temple, our body, by saying that we should never legalize drugs, whether it's marijuana or anything else. Now, some of you may think that there are, these are some gray areas, but let me tell you something about gray areas. 
There are no gray areas. There's only black and white. We humans like to say that there are gray areas because we don't like the black and the white, the right and the wrong. It's wrong to lie, but we like to say that there are gray areas where, where you should lie. And I don't think I can agree with that gray logic or any other gray logic. We are to follow the ways of God, period. There are no exceptions. And there is no gray area. Anyway, there will be suffering when you follow Jesus. But I know from experience that it's much better to suffer with Jesus than to do anything, anything without him. So we have this tremendous love and suffering going on at the same time. What are we going to do about this? The disciples finished their discourse here by basically saying that they were eyewitnesses to all the wonders that Jesus did. There was nothing that they were going to do except put their whole lives under the authority of Jesus. They would live their whole life, the rest of their lives, in total submission to Jesus Christ. We too are to submit uh, and display this, this submitting love. And we have a tough time with this because Satan has taught us that any kind of submission is weakness. We still try to live in the old, the Wild West mentality where individuality is supreme, but this couldn't be farther from the truth. Submitting to Jesus is the best thing that you can ever do. So just let me remind you of why this is and who Jesus is. When the disciples are talking, uh, uh, the death of Jesus is still fresh in everyone's mind. Everyone remembers Jesus defeated death and rose from the dead. And that by itself should be enough for all of us just to fall on our knees. But he also conquered health issues as he traveled about. And nature itself. Jesus actually built the universe and everything that's in it. I don't think anyone here knows anyone in the world that even comes close to the power of Jesus. We should submit ourselves with love to our very Creator. Not only is His love large, large and larger than a volcano, but His love is gentler, kinder, kinder and stronger than a parent's love for a child. People, we are to put our whole lives under the authority of Jesus, and when you do, things will happen. Mountains will move. Oceans will be calmed. You'll learn to love for the first time in your life. And of course, all these things are hard to do. They're hard to do, and we will make mistakes. But you have to start. You have to start. No matter what you do, you first have to start. I don't know how many times I have failed, and it's been many, but with each failure, failure I love Jesus more because of how he has helped me. It can be the same for you, and I know that many of you know exactly what I'm talking about here. It all begins by confessing and asking Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life. When you submit to Jesus, your life will be active. It will be exciting. It will be filled with awe. Jesus will be with you every step of the way, showing the love he has for you and for everyone else. It's, it's really amazing, this voyage with Jesus. It never stops. It never stops. Even in eternity. Jesus is so amazing. He's so amazing that he loves even, he loves even you. He loves even you forever. And all he asks is that you love him back. Thank you, Jesus, for first loving us. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you so much for this love you give us, Lord. And, and help us to take it. Help us to stand on your word and take your word and your love to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.